My name is Albert Park. I'm the director of the Institute for Emerging Market Studies at HKUST. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's uh, seminar. Uh, we're very happy to welcome uh, four distinguished speakers. Uh, and the topic today is about sustainability of the Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, the four presenters are going to talk about a very interesting initiative uh, that is trying to understand what are the real frontier issues in terms of sustainability. We know the Belt and Road Initiative is a massive undertaking involving many infrastructure projects in many different countries around the world. And so there are obvious concerns about the nature of the projects, how they'll impact sustainability, climate change, other things. But there are also many perhaps less appreciated, but still very important uh, ways in which uh, this initiative may be influencing the environment. And the four presenters today are going to talk about uh, an exercise done to try to identify what those, what the key issues really are. And so uh, very happy to welcome them all. Um, the first speaker, I'm going to introduce very briefly all four speakers and then I won't say much after that. Uh, the first speaker is Alice Hughes. Uh, she's uh, a professor at, associate professor at the Xishuan Banya Tropical Botanical Garden at Yunnan, uh, China. And she's a conservation biologist based in Asia who holds board positions in a number of ecological societies and NGOs and works through these to build conservation capacity in upcoming conversation and to implement conservation science and help guide conversation conservation, sorry, on regional scales. Uh, the second speaker is uh, Amy Hensley, uh, who comes from Oxford. She's a postdoctoral fellow there. Uh, her research uses interdisciplinary methods to understand complex interactions between the legal and illegal markets for bare bile in China, particularly how consumer behavior and demand influences these markets. And she previously worked at uh, UNEP World Conservation Monitoring Center on projects related to Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. Um, the third speaker is Richard Griffiths, who is a professor emeritus of economic history and international studies at Leiden University, and currently directs uh, New Silk Roads Research Project at the International Institute for Asian Studies, uh, YAS, at, uh, that's IIAS. Uh, previously, he was a professor at the University of Manchester the Free University of Amsterdam and European University Institute in Florence, an expert on European integration and critical analysis of data employed in social science and economic analysis. Um, and finally, the last speaker is uh, Angela Trito, who is a postdoctoral fellow at our Institute for Emerging Market Studies. Uh, she did a PhD in public policy at City University of Hong Kong and is working on three interrelated research projects on the Belt and Road Initiative in Southeast Asia. Her research interests include management of innovation, environmental policies and technologies, heritage management, and sustainable development. So without further ado, each speaker will speak for about 15 minutes. Uh, and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, we hope to end the seminar uh, at 5.30. So it's going to be a bit longer since we have so many speakers than our usual one hour seminar. Uh, but I think it'll be well worth the discussion, quality, et cetera. If you have any questions, um, I would suggest that you type them into the chat function in Zoom and I'll be monitoring that. Um, if you really wanna ask it in person, you can also raise your hand using the raise hand function in Zoom, if you know how to do that. Um, and we'll, uh, I think we'll reserve the question to the end, unless they're very burning kinds of clarifying questions uh, of the speakers. So uh, with that introduction, uh, let me uh, allow Alice to go ahead. Thank you and thank um, you, all of you for being here today. So it's a pleasure to start you off and give a little bit of background on the Belt and Road and some of the impacts it might have on Belt um, biodiversity, especially a number of the themes. So I will share my screen and hopefully you'll be able to see some slides. 
technical issues. Okay, so many of you will already be familiar with what the Belt and Road is. What you may not be aware of is it's the largest infrastructural project in human history. It's difficult to delimit exactly how much funding is going into the BRI, but there are some estimates that it may be up to an investment of 100 billion every year from 2017, where we started to see a real investment, to 2027. And the infrastructure needs, which are a component of this, have been quantified across about 36 countries and may be up to orders of magnitude higher. It's about um, 320 billion a year. And two thirds of this relates to transport connectivity. So that's directly looking at the Belt and Road infrastructure, the road, the rail infrastructure, which most people will have heard about. And a lot of that is going into Asia. So if we look at global infrastructure and how much investment is being made, we can see that not only has a huge amount traditionally gone into Asia at about 30% of the global total in 2015, but when we look at this year, 2020, if this whole year wasn't at a standstill, we might see up to half global infrastructure development and investment going into the Asian region which means understanding what the impact of that infrastructural investment in this region will be is critical if we want to conserve biodiversity. And if we look broadly at the Belt and Road, just to refresh ourselves, this is only part of the broad infrastructure. So you've got the roads, the rails, and you've also got the development corridors there, as well as the marine BRI and a number of ports. And we'll see broadly different impacts on biodiversity in different regions across this area. In our horizon scan, we were trying to identify frontier issues. So some of the impacts of a giant infrastructural investment projects are pretty obvious. Obviously, if you're building infrastructure, you're going to destroy whatever was there before. And if you're building that infrastructure in an area that has traditionally seen relatively little development, then you're going to cause the destruction of habitats, fragmentation of habitats, and some fairly obvious impacts. So of course, infrastructural development is a lot more complex than that. So we wanted to do a horizon scan to understand what other implications that development may have had that might be less obvious. And horizon scans are broadly developed to do that, to look into the future and see what unexpected but important developments may take place that have implications for that chosen horizon scan. In this case, how might the BRI impact on biodiversity and social issues in the areas which it's planned to transverse? Our initial team involved 14 people and using their networks, they contacted 250 people to try and work out what these novel issues might be. And that generated a list of around 100 issues. By refining them and merging them, we got this down to 60 issues. And by discussion and several rounds of voting, Eventually, we got down to 11 core issues, which we're going to discuss today, which pertain both to environmental and social impacts. Now, of course, humans live in the environment, and that meant that the social implications also have further environmental implications. And the environmental implications, of course, have many issues in the humans in these regions, especially indigenous populations. And if you've read the Horizon Scan we published, you'll notice that one of the issues was specifically about indigenous communities. So how obvious are the impacts? Well, if we look, going back to that original map of the Belt and Road showing both um, forested areas and deforestation in some of those regions, we can split out some of the ecosystems which may be obviously hit by this development. So we see these boreal and temperate forests, which have some deforestation, but as you can see in these planned routes, many of them have had relatively little deforestation, but also relatively little development in the past. Then we see tropical forests. The areas we'll often hear discussed in the press being uh, vulnerable to huge levels of deforestation, and many of these new planned routes will make formerly inaccessible regions progressively accessible. But then there are regions we often forget about, the montane regions and the drier regions, which will have a very different suite of impacts. In many of these areas, we have grassland ecosystems with migratory species, which will of course be hit in a very different way from this planned linear infrastructure. 
So thinking about how the Belt and Road is going to impact on these different systems is important, but often overlooked in many of these very different systems. And then the other important but often forgotten components of the BRI, the marine and coastal ecosystems, which are also going to be impacted by the development. So when we were considering the impacts in our horizon scan, we considered the societies, the communities and the ecosystems in all of these regions. And understanding priorities is, of course, complex. Understanding the impact of the BRI requires thinking holistically about what it will take to build infrastructure, to maintain it, and what are the implications of new infrastructure. For example, if you build a road into a new area, it's not going to be there alone. We're going to see further development and the movement of human populations. And all of these have different implications for biodiversity and for human societies across these regions. And the footprint may be far larger than we may initially imagine by just thinking about the Belt and Road. So we need to think about the risk at all stages of development. So we look at, can look at the opportunities not only to minimise that risk, but also to look at opportunities for actually enhancing conservation rather than just trying to adapt once we've already developed these areas. So one of our first issues was the spread of invisible invasives. Now, of course, many of you will have been on lockdown. Some of you may have been unlucky enough to have actually been quarantined. And I think COVID reminds us what an interconnected world we're all in. COVID is just one example of a disease that has utilized our ever more connected world to spread globally. And with growing infrastructural development, we are likely to see the further expansion and growth of invasive species. Now, Many of these areas have very little baseline data. In fact, one study in northern Thailand found that 96% of fungal diversity was undescribed. Now, of course, when we connect these areas, especially areas that have traditionally seen relatively little development, many of them may have naive populations that could be vulnerable to new diseases. And what we see in some areas, such as the Americas, is some of the greatest drivers of biodiversity loss for certain taxonomic groups. Looks like, Alice, are you there? I think we have a poor connection. Um, let's give Alice another second. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, great. Please go okay. ahead. Sorry, I don't know why it stopped there. Um, so as we see increased in connectivity, these first diseases and Uh-oh. Alice, I think we've lost you again. I don't know if you can hear me or not. So... Is anyone else having, <laughs> I guess I'm not the only one who can't hear Alice. Um, I, I, can't, I, I can't hear her. Right, thanks Edwin. Um, can I suggest that we go to the second speaker and then we can come back to Alice if she can get back on with a better connection? Alice, there seems to be a problem with your connection. So you're not, no one can hear you and the, your screen is frozen. I'm not even sure you can hear me now. But uh, why don't we go to Amy? Uh, but Alice, you'll need to unshare your screen, I think, if, uh, to allow Amy to share hers. Uh, Carla, maybe you can just um, remove Alice from the meeting. Yeah, good. All right. 
So, Amy, why don't you go ahead? Is that working? Okay. okay. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah, yes. <laughs> before I start. Um, yeah, hi, uh, my name is Amy Hinsley. I'm a senior research fellow at the University of Oxford. As mentioned in the introduction, I mainly work on the wildlife trade, so I will be presenting two issues today, but if you have any specific questions about the wildlife trade related one, then please get in touch with me. Uh, I'm sure one of the other authors could help with the other one. But yeah, I'm going to get on to wildlife trade in a minute, but first I'm going to be talking about one of our horizon scan issues, which was to do with groundwater pumping and the threat to uh, freshwater ecosystems. So as Alice uh, said, just before she, uh, she disappeared, some issues related to the, the BRI are, are quite obvious. Things like damming have been well recognized as, as a threat to freshwater ecosystems all over the world. But relatively little attention has been paid to the threats uh, from groundwater pumping. And this is something that's only started to receive a bit more attention recently. Um, there's a really good paper uh, that came out in October 2019, so really recent, which kind of discusses this a bit more. So I recommend you go and read that if you have any questions about this. And just as a background, uh, this might be quite basic to people who understand this, but I didn't know very much about groundwater pumping before this paper. So groundwater pumping is the extraction of groundwater to use for many different purposes. So agriculture is the main use for it. And it means it's really closely linked to food security, especially in, in arid regions where there's not enough rainfall and not enough surface water for, um, to support crops and to support agriculture. But it's also used a lot in construction. For example, uh, cement production is quite water intensive, but also in mining, in power stations, and lots of other activities that can be linked to infrastructure development. And the problem is, is that when extraction of groundwater is, is higher than the recharge amount coming in from rainfall and from, uh, from rivers into the system, then it, uh, it means that groundwater can be depleted. So groundwater stores can be depleted in the most extreme cases, but even before you get to that point, you can, um, you can affect the, the base flow. And the base flow is what brings in all the oxygenated um, fresh water into freshwater ecosystems, which is, is what supports life there. So the main impacts from this are that uh, aquatic systems can eventually dry out, but even if they don't dry out, um, they can just no longer be viable anymore. So even if the water's still there, uh, they're not getting the nutrients they need and the oxygenated water in to support life anymore. And in the most extreme cases, it can also lead to a reversal of flow. So that is when surface water starts flowing back into the groundwater storage. And that takes with it things like nutrients, uh, pollutants, things like heavy metals and pesticides. And that can, um, well, it can have impacts on subterranean organisms that we don't really even know very much about, but it can also mean that the groundwater storage, uh, the groundwater stores is, are polluted. And so that means that uh, the people living in that area, then their, their main source of water can then be, uh, can be polluted and not usable anymore in the long term. So like many of these issues actually that we're talking about today, this is not a unique issue to the BRI and it's also not a new issue. So the paper I mentioned at the beginning um, shows that, that many watersheds where groundwater pumping is occurring are already at their limit, already at that tipping point where they're kind of, where the base flow is being affected. And, um, and climate change is also kind of linked to this too. And under lots of different scenarios, kind of in the most extreme scenario, up to 79%, of these watersheds will have reached uh, this tipping point by 2050. But the relevance to the BRI and why it was included in this horizon scan is that um, anywhere where there's increased infrastructure development, so not just BRI, but, uh, but any kind of infrastructure being developed anywhere, whether any power stations or mining or anything like that, is gonna have an impact on this and they're gonna exacerbate these risks. And with the BRI, especially going through, through regions such as Central Asia, more arid regions, it's likely to exacerbate these threats. And uh, we identified in the paper two priorities for mitigation. And one of those is just simply to, to identify the at-risk areas and, and be aware of where groundwater is already under pressure 
and where further pumping is going to put more pressure on the system. And ideally avoid these areas, although obviously that might not always be possible, but, um, but even just kind of developing alternative practices that require less water or moving more water intensive practices to, to less vulnerable areas uh, could be potential mitigation strategies for this. So that's the end of groundwater pumping. Uh, I'm not going to move on to my second issue that I'm covering today, which is the one that I uh, potentially know a lot more about. Um, this is the expansion of traditional Chinese medicine and the impact that that might have on wildlife trade markets. Now, um, we have, uh, I wrote a, with some colleagues, wrote a paper on this, which came out in December last year. So uh, quite recent. If anyone wants to read that, um, then please do. It kind of outlines a lot of what I'm going to say today. Um, and it's, uh, it's also obviously covered in the Horizon Scan paper. And um, this picture behind um, the, the back of the slide, I put this up just to kind of show anyone who's not familiar with wildlife trade or traditional Chinese medicine, kind of the, the, the range of different um, products that can be used in traditional medicines. Um, this picture itself shows, uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow, no, um, shows um, uh, plant products, shows uh, fungal products. You have uh, caterpillar fungus over on the right and also animal products. You have uh, musk deer glands in the middle there and um, and also I think those sea urchins on the left. So this is just to kind of show the diversity of different wildlife products that uh, can potentially be used in, um, in traditional medicine products. And I think what's really interesting about this is that there's kind of historical precedent for this too. So uh, the BRI is also called the New Silk Road. In the ancient Silk Roads, traditional Chinese medicine was one of the products that was um, brought back into China uh, from uh, along the Silk Road, um, uh, where medic medicinal plants were brought into China to be used in traditional medicine uh, as uh, traditional medicine ingredients, but also traditional Chinese medicine um, treatments were sort of exported along the Silk Road to Silk Road countries. And, um, and, and it's quite interesting because that's sort of what's still happening now. And this is quite an interesting paper. I think it's only available in Chinese, but this is quite an interesting paper on um, the, the BRI and, and its links to the ancient Silk Road and traditional medicine. So these are the five pillars of the BRI. And um, the fifth pillar, the people to people exchange pillar, which is all about cultural connectivity and sort of building these cultural connections, mentions traditional Chinese medicine, medicine specifically as, um, as something that should be shared with BRI countries. And traditional medicine in general is mentioned uh, a lot in this, in this pillar as something that is a way of kind of forging connectivity between different countries. So not just traditional Chinese medicine, but the traditional medicines of, of lots of different countries. Nepal, for example, have recently signed agreements with China uh, to look at ways of sort of developing their own traditional medicine uh, industry a bit more. So it is actually a core part of the, um, of the BRI policy. And this has led in the past few years to demand for TCM ingredients increasing. Uh, Chinese state media have reported, I think it was a, I don't remember the exact figure now, but I think it's a 54% increase in demand for TCM products from uh, BRI countries. Um, and there's just been great interest all over the world, uh, everywhere. I mean, these are just a few kind of screen grabs of news stories, but everywhere from Morocco to Portugal to Zimbabwe, uh, there are uh, traditional Chinese medicine hospitals, treatment centers, training centers being established, research is taking place. Uh, and partnerships are being um, developed between China and other countries. And I think it's really important to note that the increasing use of TCM in itself is not necessarily a problem. So probably the focus of many of the exports from China will be these patent products, these packaged products for the legal market. And they'll be very well regulated. I mean, even just from uh, international wildlife trade regulations, which are going to uh, prevent the, any kind of export of uh, certain endangered species or species that where trade is, is uh, controlled. However, there are some risks that kind of go along with increasing TCM demand. One of them is um, even for legal products, uh, any kind of increased pressure on these, these, the harvesting of wild populations could lead to overexploitation. Uh, where sustainability is not really known. And this is a problem 
um, for many plant species, for example. So uh, the majority of ingredients used in traditional Chinese medicine are plants and fungi, and very little is known about the sustainability of wild harvest. Obviously, in other cases, cultivation will be used or, uh, or the plants themselves will be abundant and there'll be no issues there, but there could be issues for some species in this kind of rapid increase in demand. And then another thing which is probably the, the issue that most people sort of focus on when they think of this is potential for an, an increase as well as in the kind of legal packaged medicine trade, but also an increase in um, informal illegal products that are kind of outside the official pharmacopoeia, outside TCM, but linked to historical uses within traditional medicine. Uh, all kind of um, informal tonic products, things like wild bear gallbladders, for example, which don't feature in official TCM, but, uh, but are still believed to have medicinal value in places. So this is kind of another risk. And this was a paper published by a colleague of mine last year, which kind of mapped VRI roots onto um, or kind of through habitats of, of particularly high risk species, uh, large carnivores in particular, that are used in, uh, in medicine and, and for other reasons in the, the wildlife trade. And um, I'm really showed that, that another issue here is going to be that existing illegal wildlife trade routes potentially will be strengthened by improved infrastructure. So you have this kind of this, this double issue here of um, better connectivity, which means that the movement of these species is going to be easier, but also uh, potentially increasing demand in different places for illegal informal products. But it's really important not just to focus on the risks, I think. And um, it is possible to sustainably harvest many uh, popular medicinal species. Um, this is a really good example. This is Southern Shisandra. And this is from a project that was established in Sichuan province in China to, uh, to set up village cooperatives to harvest the berries of this, uh, of this plant, which is used widely in traditional medicine. And, um, and it's kind of using this market-based approach to protecting uh, the habitat, which is also a giant panda habitat in this case, but also to support livelihoods and to, uh, to, to ensure that trade is sustainable. So one other um, potential benefit of this is that uh, increasing demand for TCM could be used to develop sustainable supply chains, which could help people and also wildlife. And uh, we just came up in, in that paper I mentioned at the beginning, we came up with kind of four step uh, way to, to really think about the threats from TCM and uh, from TCM demand expanding outside into the BRI and to, to really think about um, understanding the threats and developing mitigation strategies that are, that are targeted at specific species and country examples so that we can better monitor and enforce and also encourage sustainable use where that's possible. Uh, that's the end of my list. Great. Uh, now over to Richard. Oh, wait. Oh, no, we need to go. Am I okay now? <laughs> Hello? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, my name's Richard Griffiths. Um, I'm retired, so I do nothing except run a small project on the new Silk Roads at the IIS in Leiden. I've been asked to address uh, three particular topics, so I'll do those in reverse order. Um, first, I've been asked to talk about infrastructure building in conflict zones. I'll look at in a second. Then I'm looking at the effect of geopolitical rivalry and the environmental impact of that. And finally, I'll turn to uh, look at the Arctic Silk Road um, and the effect of infrastructure in the polar regions. So the building in the conflict zones, I think, fits very well with what Amy's just been saying on illegal trade, because evidently in border zones where there are military conflicts, low scale uh, insurrections, then uh, the border, porous border problem increases and there's also very little actual control um, and sanctions of what's going on. So basically the first problem of building infrastructure there is the actual environmental impact on the builders themselves because they are in a dangerous situation. But basically, when infrastructure building is occurring in these areas, it exacerbates the porous border problem. And you'll get a rise in illegal trade in plants, uh, animals, illegal logging, illegal mining, and of course, uh, human trafficking. 
Another problem that's fairly evidently associated with it is that it complicates any chance of doing environmental assessments in gathering the information you need to make these assessments and then in actually controlling that the assessments are actually done and, impl and implemented during the building process. So everything that we would associate normally with the environmental dangers of uh, infrastructure are just exacerbated when it occurs in conflict zones. So now I want to turn to geopolitical rivalry and the environmental impact in this. Now, I don't think those two things are necessarily self-evident. You see, the assumption here is that China's BRI is geopolitical and therefore distinctly different from uh, what the West has done and therefore, because it's China, therefore suspect in some way. Now, I'm not sure that that is necessarily the correct uh, logic. You see, basically, China is providing infrastructure, and it doesn't do it double, it's providing infrastructure where other international organizations, development banks, countries are not providing it. It is an addition to what national governments would actually build and what other foreign banks and uh, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, et cetera, are willing to provide. The rivalry comes when it is juxtaposed with something else. So you have, for example, the India and Japan initiative that says we, we want quality infrastructure, that America says we're going to give less, but it's going to be better infrastructure. And that implies that there is something implicitly wrong with Chinese infrastructure. Now, let's be honest, China's approach to the BRI investment is different from that of traditional uh, foreign aid today and uh, World Bank and Asian Development Bank lending. China deals clearly on government-to-government -government operations. It's a memorandum of understanding with governments on an agreed list of projects. In other words, China funds projects that are already approved of by the national partner government. This implies, therefore, that it's the national government that's responsible for the evaluation, the environmental impact assessments, and not necessarily China. But is this approach fundamentally different in the effect of that assessment from the traditional Western aid approach? Many Western donors say, well, we want to deal directly with the local community. And when we've got all the um, conditions satisfied, then we'll move the project up for approval by the national government and the implementation. This implies in turn that the assessments that are done and that are actually controlled and evaluated afterwards are going to be substantially different from what China is doing. So I think that question needs to be reposed. Re it's not the question of rivalry, who is actually doing the building. It is the question of which standards should apply, what the level of environmental control should be. And there we've got the basic dilemma. In China's case, the initial assessment is done by the home country, basically presumably on its legislation, China, when it's building it then, might, might actually supplement those environmental controls or not. And we have the IGOs that have also their standards, which are often claimed to be higher, or certainly different from those of China. But it's not just a question of assessing a project. And I've seen this a lot in the evaluations of projects. Once we've established a letter of what we think is going to happen, there's almost a Stalinist system of control Richard, I think you need to unmute yourself. Somehow you got muted. Carla, can you unmute him? I'm unmuted now. Okay, yes, great. Please go ahead. I think we okay. missed the last little bit. Okay. So before I finish this section then, I think that the 
we need to redefine this uh, issue so that it says what are the actual environmental standards that are employed projects no matter who is doing it and how far are they actually observed during the execution of the projects themselves so i want to turn to the last question um, that of the particular challenge that's emerging in the arctic regions these regions are going to come under environmental stress and environmental strain regardless of what is happening because the melting of the ice caps with global warming is going to have a global impact on water levels and is in itself going to change fundamentally the ecosystems of that entire area so the development of the arctic region completely predates the belt and road initiative um, the Arctic Silk Road might be a good form of branding, but that Silk Road's already been moving for several decades. Oil from the subarctic regions of Russia are being exported to Western Europe for several decades. There are policy statements by the European Union on further developing the Arctic routes that say all the good things about control, about taking care of everything else, in terminology that is almost exactly identical to that of China's Arctic White Paper. The only difference for Western observers is that China has said the one and the European Union has said the other. So basically, this isn't a BRI issue, it's a general issue. And as the ice packs melt as the permafrost goes the opportunity for exploitation it's going to become a chance this is already what the russians have said um, they have the largest land area in this uh, region um, and they say yeah it, it's going to be an opportunity to be honest i can't see the current american administration standing back and saying oh we're going to take care of all sort of environmental legislation they're demolishing it across the united states I don't see why they're now going to take higher standards in Alaska. Um, so basically, the exploitation of these regions is going to go ahead, whether it's the BRI or not. So let's have a look at what that infrastructure involves. Already, you've got oil going to Western Europe. And in addition to that, now you have the exploitation of the Yamal gas fields. The Yamal gas fields are on China's Belt and Road. Um, it's mostly Russia that's developing it. It's Russian firms, it's Russian capital. But uh, the Chinese uh, Silk Road Fund has um, put in some money into the development of Yamal 1. And so it's on China's Belt and Road. But you could just as easily put it on France's Belt and Road. Uh, France, Total, a holder in the Russian exploitation firm, and Total has also invested above that in the project itself. In fact, the amount of French money in Yamal 1 is about the same as China's money. So, and more, even more money is put in by the Russians. It's not China's project, which is a shared international project. Yamal 1 is already in full production, and there's plans, cost about $20 billion. These are huge investments. And there are plans for Yamal 2. And Yamal 2 will have Russia, Total, France, China, plus Japan and Korea. So basically, this, this is developing with or without China. China's taking a share in that. It's also wanting to develop uh, icebreakers to help um, get that liquefied natural gas out of the area. Um, but it's Japan that's suggesting building a hub in. Uh, warmer waters on the east side of Russia so that the icebreakers can offload their na uh, liquefied natural gas, which you probably all know has to be kept at a sort of 200 minus 230 degrees centigrade and then reloaded onto uh, other ships, uh, more traditional gas carriers. So those facilities are being developed not just by China, but by Russia and by other East Asian and European partners. The second thing we have to look at if we're looking at the Arctic is the trade route across um, from east to west or west to east. At the moment, um, you're getting some headline ships that are going through with relatively small cargoes. 
Um, and there is going to be a while before this really starts developing because the entrance to the east end of the Arctic um, is much narrower and shallower than it is in the west. So you can't have large container ships going through. And by reinforcing them heavily um, to break ice, they become very expensive. It'll be a while then before the northern trade route begins to run. When the smelting of the ice goes further, then you can expect that route to develop quite quickly at the expense of the southern route because it's substantially shorter to go from China to Western Europe by boat over the Arctic route than it is further south. But if the loads are smaller, the economics of that is going to be less immediately obvious. And then the final thing you're going to get is further development. Um, we'll look at that in a sec, but there are plans now for railways. The Russians have uh, issued their railway plans. And between now and 2023, there'll be approval, or otherwise, after assessment, of 1,800 kilometers of new railway in that Arctic region. Um, it could be that the current fall in oil prices might um, derail, if you'll excuse the term, derail that project. Um, but at the moment, it could be that in the next decade, we have a large amount of new railways going through pristine uh, permafrost areas, going through forested areas, where basically up till then, little habitation has occurred. So let's have a look briefly then at the environmental impacts. The first thing you're going to have is a higher population density. Round these ports, round these mines, round the mineral exploitations, you're going to get a growth of populations, a larger human foot footprint. And as that goes into all the ancillary services, um, it's going to mean just generally more environmental pressure on the region. Then you have to take into account the mineral uh, exploitation. Um, going for natural gas has a less of an impact once you've got everything there than, for example, open plan mining. Um, if you look at how much of these mines gouge into uh, pristine areas of Australia, and you can just transplant that into the Arctic, and you can imagine what a massive impact that is going to have on traditional migration routes, um, on local ground pollution, um, et cetera. So yeah, it doesn't really bear thinking about. The shipping, I think, is going to be less of a problem. Um, there's always the danger of accidents um, and oil spillages. Um, but I don't think that's going to be as much of a problem as the noise and the general pollution effect of shipping. Um, we don't know what the impact is because of noise in what is basically a very quiet ocean space and what that will do with the large whales and other mammals um, that live in the region. Not only that, but the recent um, sulfur deficient fuels that are going to be used actually turn out to produce much more black carbon spectacles. And if that goes on the ice, it's unseemly, but if it goes in large volumes, it will also stop um, the, uh, oh, sorry, accelerate the warming of the region. So it's going to be cutting through um, various intact habitats. And I think one thing that hasn't been mentioned too much is it's going into what is basically the unexamined archive of mankind 11,000 years ago. Buried under the ice is our, or the footprint of our forefathers and four, four thousands, thousands of years back. Already we're discovering animal parts with um, actual animal matter intact. Um, it, imagine what that will do in the black market when that starts selling. But this will allow DNA research, um, and allow a deeper understanding of how life on our Earth, our warmer Earth, actually developed. And I don't like to say this, in that DNA, in that permafrost, rest also diseases and viruses, which we've never discovered, which have lain dormant for thousands of years. And in these post-corona or corona epidemic uh, days, I don't have to say what that could actually cause. It's going to take a lot of international cooperation. International cooperation devoid of geopolitical suspicions and charges and everything else in order to really develop 
in a careful and responsible way uh, these very pristine, very challenging uh, new areas. So I want to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, very interesting. Uh, we're gonna try to go back to Alice now. Uh, Alice, do you wanna give it another shot here? Hopefully we won't have any more technical difficulties. Yep, hopefully uh, that's the uh, connectivity is going to be better as I talk about connectivity this time. Okay, so. So hopefully that is working and you can both hear me and see my slides. So going back to that one, great starting off point from Richard there talking about the uh, diseases. It's true that in the Antarctic, uh, thawing out anthrax has been detected. And so it really does highlight that there are clear biosecurity risks. And with COVID, and here I am in China, thankfully, uh, slowly coming out of lockdown. Um, biosecurity is something we need to explore on a global basis. And as we see increasing connectivity in tune with the BRI, there is going to be a huge amount of effort to, needed to look at the traffic of animals, of humans, and of plant matter. So for example, if we think about livestock being moved across Central Asia, there is a huge potential issue there that it could spread diseases to the animals in that area. For example, the saiga showed um, unprecedented die-offs a few years ago that was related to a disease. Now that wasn't linked to humans this time, but we are going to see naive populations being exposed to these kinds of diseases in the future, unless we have strict and clear biosecurity protocols in place to prevent those very very real issues that we are seeing now. And that comes with pet, uh, not only humans, but also livestock, um, crops and pests. Um, the next issue that we need to consider is what are we treading on? It's not just that we are treading on pristine environments, but as we create new infrastructure, it also requires raw materials. And though in the past few years, we've become increasingly aware of the impacts of sand mining, most of you have probably never even thought about the implications of cement. Now, cement is a ubiquitous material. What you may not be aware of is much of it, and especially in Southeast Asia, is coming from native limestone ecosystems, especially from cast. And China is actually the biggest consumer of cement in the world. They use about 63% of global cement every year. That is around 1.7 tons per person per year for the 1.33 billion people in China. In fact, in just two years, they use 6.6 .6 gigatons of cement, which is more than the US in recorded history. And the consequence of that huge cement consumption is that we are seeing a 6% loss in limestone ecosystems every year. Now, a 6% loss in any ecosystem sounds significant, but when we consider the huge level of endemism in limestone ecosystems, it's having a huge effect. So let's just think for a moment about some of the species that depend on those ecosystems. So here you see a zoomed in flash of limestone ecosystems in a small part of China. Now, what you may not be aware of is that actually limestone ecosystems make up up to 20% of terrestrial land areas but there is a huge diversity in what those ecosystems might look like. And as they're a naturally fragmented ecosystem, any limestone hill may have unique species. In fact, a single hill, which may be smaller than the building each of you are sitting in now, may have more than 12 species found nowhere else on Earth. And when we think about some of the spectacular species that are adapted to live on limestone, we could potentially lose a huge number of unique species. Every survey to date has found new species, and that includes not only very strange beetles like the Trekine giraffe cave, be um, cave beetles, but also things like the limestone snails. Micro snails are the smallest snails on Earth. The smallest can fit in the eye of a needle, and up to 100 species can live on a single calf. But we also see up to half the world's urticaceae species, 20% of Jasneriads and Begonia, 
and other groups like orchids, which show tremendous levels of endemism and adaptation to casts. We also see the cast geckos, and unfortunately, these are also targeted for the pet trade. So as we see increasing connectivity as well as increasing destruction, these guys will not only lose their habitats, and these are some of the groups that are often found on just one hill, which may become the next road, but they also may be discovered in the access to that new hill and then exported for pet trade. This is one set of surveys for limestone cast geckos in Malaysia. Each color represents a distinct species. You can see most of them are found in just one site. Now, most of those areas were surveyed once. Most limestone hills have never been surveyed. And so when you see limestone uh, casts being used for cement, and most of them have never had a biodiversity inventory, you could probably weigh that road cement in terms of the number of extinctions that we might see. Not only is that cement going to have vast carbon emissions and cause a climatic warning, warming, but it in itself is going to cause extinction. So unless we look at sustainable supply chains, we could see a huge amount of extinction just from the raw materials used to create the road itself. And all of these images are actually from papers describing new species from limestone surveys. Most of those hills have never been surveyed. If we look globally at where we see limestone ecosystems, here is just one map of casts. Unfortunately, when we look at it closely, so this is a map that my research group created for limestone casts in Yunnan, we see that there are huge disparities. Mapping out where these ecosystems are is challenging. Not only do the forms often vary tremendously, but they can be covered in forest, meaning we have no good map of these ecosystems. What we do know is they're fragmented and disconnected. We don't know the patterns of biodiversity and how biodiversity connects between different castes. But without protection, and they are disproportionately underprotected, we may see a vast loss in these underprotected species just to develop the road itself before we even consider those that are fragmented by its construction. Now, this is not a map of limestone cast. This is a map of all mines from a paper that I published two years ago that showed that there is a very strong relationship between the um, actual planned routes of the Belt and Road and existing mining hotspots. So other forms of unique rocky ecosystem may also be targeted because you can see from the graph there, there is a huge relationship between the proximity to existing mines and where these planned groups are. And in areas where we don't yet have mines, they may be targeted, as well as seeing increased intensity in existing mines. So any form of rocky ecosystem which has unique species adapted to that ecosystem may be very vulnerable to development, either for raw, raw materials themselves or for increased export due to access to these new markets. Now, of course, limestone ecosystems are not the only ecosystems that are at risk and often neglected. Coastal ecosystems are also potentially under threat. And in fact, if we look at China or other areas, we see actually wetland ecosystems on coastlines are some of the most threatened. China alone in 50 years lost 53% of its coastal wetlands. This included 73% of mangrove forests. And anyone who studied these ecosystems will know that mangrove forests not only provide an important coastal buffer that prevent it from things like tsunamis, but also form essential nurseries for fish species, both freshwater and marine species. And so these are hugely important ecosystems for terrestrial and marine species. And yet, as we see increasing numbers of ports, increasing shipping connectivity, we see increasing reclamation and development of these coastal areas. And that is only going to increase as we see increased investment in these areas. In fact, when we look at the decrease, we see a loss in China alone of over 1.4 million hectares. To put that into perspective, it's about 81 times the size of Beijing. And though there are targets to protect it, we don't know if they are happening fast enough. 
if we're to look at the loss of tidal flats, and as I'll say in a moment, these are critically important ecosystems for not only marine and um, freshwater groups, but also groups of birds because of the East Australian flyway, we see a huge loss in these coastal ecosystems. And in fact, if you're to graph it out, China alone and South Korea have lost up to 76% of coastal ecosystems. They are some of the most neglected ecosystems. And with increased development, they are likely to be some of the hardest hit. But what's the significance? If we look at the, some of the groups dependent on them, so focusing for a moment on the wading birds, again, just thinking about this in terms of scale, there are over 50 million migratory birds that fly along the East Australian flyway every year between Australia in the south up to China and Russia in the north. Many of them depend on intact coastal habitat for breeding, for wintering, and for migration. And yet for some of these species, we have seen population decreases of over 70%, in large part because of the loss of coastal habitat. Now, we can analyze this and look at where these species are. This is a map that actually we published early last year with Lija from the IUCN, looking at the diversity of migratory birds along the East Australian flyway. And what we can see very clearly is that those yellow sea tidal flats are essential areas. And if we break it into the two critical phases of the year that these species are actually stationary, the breeding and the non-breeding period, we see that these are critical areas. And the yellow sea in particular is an essential area for breeding. If we see increased development as we are likely to do from the Belt and Road Initiative, especially from the marine BRI, and the fact that these ecosystems are so neglected, we will see the further loss of these species unless further mechanisms are put in place to protect tidal habitat, but also to look at things like pollution and land reclamation in these areas, which are all likely to grow in tune with development of the Belton Road. Conservation of these species is challenging. They are not stationary and their populations will be limited by the conservation endeavors at the most limiting period. That includes not just the breeding and overwintering phases, but also their stopover sites along the way. So we need to think about the construction of these ports and development in these coastal zones and the interface between the terrestrial and the marine BRI. Because if these regions are neglected, we're going to see huge losses in a wide sweep of taxa that depends on these areas. Another ecosystem which is typically neglected are deserts. When people talk about deserts, we think about desertification, barren and empty ecosystems with little biodiversity. And in fact, both deserts and savannas are often the targets of regreening efforts. When we think of climate initiatives from Africa across uh, Europe and Eurasia, we often see these ecosystems being targeted for tree planting projects. In Pakistan, there is the uh, tree tsunami that is currently being planned, which plans to plant literally millions of trees. And in Africa, they are planning to make belts of trees across the continent, which are part of re-greening efforts. Countries across the routes of the BRI are also talking about these re-greening efforts. The initiative being that surely these barren desert ecosystems will be improved and made more biodiverse by filling them with trees or making them commercially viable. The problem is that all species, I mean, all ecosystems have species which depend on them. And many neglected ecosystems like deserts and savannas have many native specialist species which will not benefit from these efforts to regreen them, especially when those regreening and restoration efforts are actually commercial ventures using non-native species. Organizations like eLion have won many awards from the UNCCD, the Anti-Desertification Organization. And yet when we look at the records and look at the surveys from these regions, there is very little data on native biodiversity. So despite claims that diversity has vastly increased, if you try and find any baseline surveys on biodiversity, there is almost nothing published. And like any other ecosystem, if we are going to develop it, we need a thorough environmental impact assessment 
to make sure that that assessment is based on what diversity exists and that restoration generally targets restoring it to its native form and enhancing how habitability is for native species. Unfortunately, this is rarely the case and understanding these systems is key to conserving them. So as we have partnerships growing through ANSO and other organizations in tune with the BRI, we need to make sure that restoration is genuinely restoration and not commercialization under another guise. And we see that there are letters that have been going on for, this one was published in 2012, saying how forgotten the biodiversity in these ecosystems are. But we still don't seem to have learned this lesson. And we need to treat all ecosystems as equal and make sure that when we restore them, it is based on the best available data, not just by using data that is already out there, but ensuring that having a fact-based assessment is part of the protocol. So when we think about scaling these priorities across ecosystems, we need to think about what restoration really means. If it's part of the alliances, as it may be, we need to make sure it's based on data. Restoration and regreening re may actively damage native diversity if they're done inappropriately and not based on appropriate data. Agriculture is a major driver of loss of biodiversity. And these so-called forests in much of Southeast Asia are actually monocultures of non-native species. In fact, many of the regreening efforts, which have been targeted largely at climate change, have been using Heba brasiliensis, which is native to Brazil and has no benefit to native biodiversity. So policies around things like tree planting and regreening must be sensitive to native biodiversity. And this is especially important to recognize in concert with the BRI when many of the efforts to actually re-queen are targeted at BRI countries and making sure they are based on ecology is essential to make sure they help rather than hindering native diversity. We also need to think about the implications on these systems. As has been mentioned by others here, freshwater ecosystems are vulnerable. This is likely to especially be the case if you use a water thirsty species like eucalyptus for your restoration, which may cause drops in the water table and make the area even less suitable for native biodiversity. This may look like paradise for some, but think about what species formerly inhabited this area. Is it really a paradise for the species that were there before we moved in? And we need to think about what restoration means and make sure that it is not actually expense, at the expense of native species. Most of the topics I have focused on look at the need of protection of native ecosystems. The four cases I've talked about show that the lack of data in these regions hinders effective conservation and makes them vulnerable to development, which may destroy native biodiversity. We can't protect native areas without understanding what meaningful, effective biodiversity priorities are. How do we estimate the impacts of change without a baseline of biodiversity? So using initiatives like the Red List of Ecosystem and having careful environmental and social impact assessments to mitigate the potential effects of development are going to be essential to make sure that our plans are informed by the data and that we don't lose biodiversity more than we can help as we develop um, infrastructure across these areas. So with that, I'd like to hand on to our last speaker, Angela, and thank you all for listening. I, I wanna remind people that as soon as Angela's done, we'll have Q&A, so if you have any questions, you can start typing them into chat right now. So Angela, please go ahead. Yes, uh, Alice, can you unshare the screen, please? Yep, I'm trying to do that. It's uh, hopefully going to, okay. So that should hopefully deactivate it. Um, it says that it's not, ah, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, you should be on share now. Okay, perfect. I think it's fine. Yeah, okay. So hello everyone, and I hope you're not too tired and you can just bear with me for the last couple of issues in our paper, and then I can provide some concluding remarks for you. So the first issue actually presents both challenges and opportunities, and it's about harmonizing environmental and social standards that govern investments and infrastructure development. 
So far, research has highlighted frequent misalignments between international and domestic environmental and social standards, for instance, in the requirements of environmental and social impact assessments and in monitoring mechanisms, but also between international standards like the one promoted by IFC and the different multilateral development banks and the key Chinese financial institutions, which are becoming much more prominent in uh, financing international projects through the Belt and Road Initiative. Also, since the Belt and Road Initiative includes mostly developing countries that have weaker environmental legislation and lacks enfor enforcement, there is also a risk that the increase of trade and investment from China will go into pollution heavens, creating severe environmental and social challenges. So the weak legal frameworks and implementation capacity at national and subnational level is actually the most critical issue in ensuring sustainability of Belt and Road Initiative projects. Uh, when we think of the BRI, most people think of the AIIB, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, as one of its leading finance examples. So here I just wanted to give you a quick glimpse into this study by Meng Chi Shao and Professor Meitan Mullins from the University of Nottingham in Bo, which is still under review. So this study reviewed 15 energy projects uh, approved by AIIB and found that its environmental and social framework is uh, less mature and less comprehensive. Uh, than other ones uh, by other MDBs, such as the World Bank or the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And this is actually understandable because AIIB is much newer. Uh, but also, uh, AIIB adopts a flexible mechanism that allows the adoption of other standards, either from the host country or from other MDBs. And so we see that actually this is uh, happening in the majority of cases, because 11 out of 15 um, projects actually adopt not AIIB standards, but the standards of uh, other co-financing institutions. So what the study concludes is generally um, AIIB could become more proactive in uh, the promotion, enforcement, and diffusion of uh, environmental and social standards. Um, so on the one hand, there is an opportunity coming from the fact that certain countries might up upgrade their laws uh, to match AIIB standards, and the paper shows that this is happening in some cases. But on the other hand, uh, AIIB's flexibility can provide leeway for countries that don't have strong uh, environmental commitments to obtain financing anyway. And when we look at the reality, actually we see that uh, the amount financed by AIIB is actually a small percentage of the total of BRI projects, uh, which are mostly financed by the big four policy banks inside China, among which Bank of China is the most prominent abroad. Uh, then by China Development Bank and the China Exim Bank. And most of these Chinese banks do not have yet specific guidelines or commitments for ensuring environmental and social safeguards. Um, and actually a common criticism from international analysts is that uh, banks like uh, uh, CDB and Exim Bank have actually become the leading financiers of uh, coal power plants in the world. And here from my own research on Indonesia, you can see the massive jump in the financing of uh, coal power plants between 2013 and 2015. Um, then they actually stopped. And this can be a result of different factors, such as the commitment after the Paris Agreement for promoting a Green Belt and Road Initiative, but also it can be a result of the capital control from uh, China. But still after the BRI, 14 new deals for new coal power plants uh, were made just in Indonesia alone. So it's a matter of seeing whether these deals will go ahead or if they might be renegotiated into different types of power plants. But on the positive side, we can also see a good example of governance from countries like Myanmar, for instance. Myanmar is often regarded as the last frontier market in Southeast Asia, and there is much interest in building infrastructure into the country from different MDVs, but also from uh, Chinese, Japanese, and uh, Korean institutions and, and companies. So the government of Myanmar, advised by the World Bank office in Yangon, uh, created this project bank mechanism to promote transparency and to facilitate the screening of uh, um, uh, the screening, consultation and financing of large infrastructure projects in the country. So this project bank is essentially a, a web based platform and you can all go and consult it online uh, that aims to create a strategic alignment among the flow of development assistance. Um, the allocation of government budget and the participation of the private sector in infrastructure development. Um, 
Myanmar has also established a new uh, public-private partnership center under the Ministry of uh, Planning and Finance, uh, which is responsible for the evaluation of this project. So overall, this is quite an innovative um, solution that creates a more open mechanism uh, that can in turn allow the use of better environmental and social standards uh, and allows everyone to consult uh, these projects. So it somehow addresses the problem of transparency. The next issue relates to the inclusive governance and management of the territories of life, recognizing the role of culture in uh, the conservation of biodiversity. So first of all, I wanted to uh, give a quick definition in case some, some of you may not know what are territories of life. Um, so they're basically territories or area conserved by indigenous people and local communities. And they are actually characterized uh, by a close and deep connection between the territory and its people and by a functioning governance institution through which the local community uh, makes and enforces decision and rules for the conservation of nature and for the well-being of society. Currently, over a quarter of the world's land across 87 countries falls under collective uh, local governance, overlapping 40% overlapping of protected areas and many biodiversity hot hotspots. So BRI projects transact many of these territories, uh, but the potential social and environmental impacts are still not to be not quantified. And laws often provide insufficient protection, as you can see in the above map, where basically all the red and orange territory has limited or no protection for indigenous rights. So of course, this is an, this is an issue and uh, uh, local communities should be included throughout all stages of planning and implementation of projects. But in reality, this doesn't often happen. And also I have observed during my own research in Southeast Asia, uh, that actually most disputes uh, of Chinese invest investment projects uh, often come down to the lack of consultation uh, of the impacted communities. So BRI projects need action plans that protect the rights of uh, indigenous and local communities to ensure their full participation in uh, environmental management, but also in other development dialogues that, they, that relate to infrastructure projects. So moving on into the conclusion, um, many of these issues that we have identified in our horizon scan, particularly the traditional Chinese medicine supply chain issue, um, the harmonization of environmental standards, geopolitical rivalry, uh, and building infrastructure in conflict zones suggest that China needs uh, to increase its participation in global environmental governance. So on the one hand, China has created many policies, both to green the BRI and domestically to improve its own environmental governance. But while inside China, these policies are followed by concrete action and many results, uh, BRI projects, perhaps because they also include many different stakeholders, are still lacking stronger environmental and social safeguards. In particular, when we look at the reality of certain projects, there is indeed a key dilemma that starts from the rivalry over infrastructure development in conjunction with the closed door negotiation and the lack of transparency and political objectives from uh, uh, local politicians inside countries. Um, and the combination of this factor can often create a rush for the timing of construction and implementation of certain projects, which can in turn result in unsustainable outcomes since many projects have had very little time for conducting comprehensive environmental and impact assessments or consultations with the local communities. So the possible solutions are actually quite simple and they include adopting a more transparent and inclusive process uh, of negotiation move towards more cooperative modes of governance to avoid rivalry and a race to the bottom. Chinese lenders could also become more proactive in developing, applying and diffusing environmental and social standards and could commit to not funding new coal power plants uh, and to the conversion of uh, the deals that are still under negotiation as other banks have done. Um, and also there is a possibility to apply um, different environmental innovations that have been successful inside China, for instance, the concept of uh, ecological red lines to the rest of uh, the world and to BRI projects. So overall, we can see plenty of opportunities ahead for China, but also for other stakeholders uh, at both national, international and uh, local level for uh, creating better environmental governance of infrastructure. And with this, I would like 
to thank you. I hope you enjoy your seminar and we welcome any questions. Thank you. And, uh, Great, thank you, uh, Angela. Um, so uh, if there are any questions, you can either type it into chat or raise your hand through the Zoom function. Uh, why don't I start as moderator and ask a, a few uh, questions. Um, I had two specific questions, um, one of Amy and one of Richard, and then I had kind of a general question for any of you. Uh, for Amy, you talked about the impact of groundwater um, pumping, but I wasn't clear uh, how are you drawing the link between BRI and groundwater pumping? Is it, does this, all infrastructure projects lead to greater groundwater pumping or is it a specific type of project? And then, yeah, sorry. sorry. Let me just do them all and then you can. <laughs> Uh, respond one at a time. And for Richard, um, so uh, it was very interesting. I, I really learned a lot about the Arctic trade route issue from your presentation. But I was wondering, I, it, of course, it's going to put a lot more pressure on the on environmental issues in the regions that are being exploited in the Arctic. But if it's diverting trade from other, if, if people are going to the north instead of the south, how do we balance kind of the benefits of the reduced pressure in the southern trade routes, as opposed to the increased pressure in the northern trade routes. I was just curious if you had any thoughts on that. And finally, for the whole group, um, it's a really fascinating presentation because you really see how having an uh, interdisciplinary group and people with really different areas, uh, different perspectives and areas of expertise, can, you can see the whole range of issues that kind of come, come, come to the front in thinking about the impacts of the BRI. But I was wondering, as a group, whether when you were discussing this, since the horizon scan exercise essentially is a, is a ranking exercise, whether, number one, did, were there some of these issues that you presented that are even more important? Like, was there a clear consensus, number one, two, three? Or was there a lot of disagreement across the group about really how, how these different, how important they were? I'm just curious about how that uh, conversation went. So thank you. Maybe, uh, maybe Amy and then Richard and then anyone. Okay, with the groundwater pumping, um, I think it's it's going to be a feature of any infrastructure project, especially ones that take place in arid areas. And so it's not unique to the BRI at all, but it's more that uh, the BRI will uh, rapidly increase the number of infrastructure projects taking place, but also going through areas such as Central Asia where it is more arid and where more groundwater will need to be extracted. So it's more kind of looking at, at how BRI might exacerbate the pressures rather than kind of creating a new pressure, because this is already happening in lots of places already. Okay, I'll come in on uh, my question. Um, I said that there will be an increase in trade using the Arctic route. Uh, whether that is at the expense of the southern trade, we have to take two things into account. Firstly, world trade generally is going to increase over the next 20, 30 years. So it could be that a share of that trade will take the Arctic route instead of southern routes. So it's, uh, it's not necessarily the gain of one loss of the other, it'll be a relative sum. But secondly, you have to look at what these routes will involve. Most of that trade will presumably be either raw material trade out of Russia, which is what it is at the moment, it's oil and gas. But when it becomes consumer goods, you have to realize that these large container ships they're like bus services. They stop at a number of ports on route. If you go across the northern route, there's hardly anybody in that route at the moment. So you have to do it in one big go. And that really will put a lot of pressure on taking a large number of ships or a large number of containers, which is very large ships. It'll be a while before that actually happens, if it happens. But that will limit the effectiveness of that route because you can't make your profit by dropping off uh, containers at various ports on route. So an average uh, container ship from China to Europe will probably have about seven or eight stops on route where it'll stay for a day, unload and take up containers. That won't be possible across the northern route. So it'll be a different type of trade. As I say, at the moment, you can't get large container ships through that route anyway, with or without ice breaking. So we have, I think, some time there before it gets used. But the pressure is already coming for the liquefied natural gas that's now going um, in both directions, and that's going up very, very fast. Okay, does anyone want to tackle this 
kind of questioned everybody about the nature of the dialogue here? So I can say a little bit, and I'm sure Angela had something to say too. The reality is that how do you quantify any form of impact? Because all of these potential issues are going to impact on different things in different ways. And something interesting we did within the scan is we had a combination of social scientists and natural scientists, and we looked to see how they varied in their ranking of different issues. And we did find there were some distinct differences. And of course, with a wider group of people, we would have had an even more diverse dialogue around those issues. Much of these potential impacts depend on how we handle and how we mitigate these things into the future. Do we, for example, decide we are going to use polymers instead of cement, in which case we get rid of the impact on the limestone ecosystems, but we're going to have other issues from the disposal of polymers, for example. Um, we had a lot of very diverse, different uh, discussions on what was going to have the greatest impact. There were a lot of opinions that some of the freshwater ecosystems could be particularly impacted because they're going to be impacted in so many ways. But other than that, a lot of it will be down to how we handle this into the future. And it's very difficult to actually rank them in terms of weighing up two very different forms of implicational impact because everything impacts in a different way. Angela, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I just wanted to say that it was a great uh, experience and uh, we were all very civilized, no conflict, no fights over anything. And uh, I think we just learned a lot from each other, like the, the fact of mixing uh, natural scientists and social scientists for me was something new. And I think I really enjoyed it because we learned a lot. And uh, sometimes the only thing that I thought is because we had some pressure to come up with novel issues, uh, my, my thinking was that sometimes there are not very novel issues that we all know, but in terms of uh, severity and impact, they were much, uh, they were stronger. So this is the, the main thought that I came also back with. <laughs> Great. Um, so uh, Richard, there's a question in the chat for you and it's uh, asking about, uh, you can read it yourself, but uh, let me paraphrase. It's kind of questioning how the governance is gonna work in this Arctic area given that uh, the questioner says the US refuses China's claims in the area and uh, Russia and China have now a kind of a closer engagement and Russia has always also initiated this Eurasian Economic Union. So how can there be effective governance when kind of claims to governance are disputed and very multi, you know, multipolar? There's a lot of saber rattling going on uh, over that area, and it's really quite frightening. Um, but for almost everywhere, if the ice disappears altogether, then it will be the fastest trade route between China and America and America and, and Europe. So it could be much bigger than that, but we're talking way in the future. At that stage, there'll be a, an open ocean and um, an open to exploitation uh, area. I think we have to leave China out. We can't keep making China a specific of everything. It is Russia, Japan, um, sorry, Russia, <laughs> Canada, United States, Norway, and those are the main countries involved. That's the territory it's on. Those governments are the ones making the decisions. The infrastructural building, the exploitation in Russia is Russian. Um, the markets might be partly China, but they could be other markets too. Um, so I'd take it off the BRI. It's not a China issue. It is those four countries, the European Union, Russia, USA, and Canada. And they're the ones that have to get together. If you want to throw in China and then repoliticize it by putting the Chinese element in as the extra danger, then you're moving steps away. The rhetoric of the Belt and Road is very successful, but sometimes it works against international cooperation rather than in its favor. It should be possible to establish certain basic ground rules for um, newly discovered uh, species of DNA, etc. We must be able to do that. That is vital for the human stock of knowledge and development. Um, there must be rules for 
the transport of dangerous materials overseas. Um, but whether you're going to get international governments over national mineral exploitation, I don't know. We've failed so far to do that for oil in the United States, so I don't see how you're going to do it for oil and gas and coal and other minerals in Russia. I'm not optimistic, but I think there has to be some basic lines um, of control that could be agreed and can easily be, be agreed. But as soon as you throw in the China political dimension, you're moving that agreement several steps further away. I hope that answers it. Uh, yeah. I'm a historian. I don't deal with uh, the future usually. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, are there any other, I'm not seeing any other questions pop up. So let me ask less, one final question and then we can maybe close. So I, I, there's no academic discussion which doesn't try to talk about COVID-19. And I know your conversation occurred before the whole pandemic. And I'm just wondering if you think back on it, how do you think, uh, thinking about co the COVID experience, how does that change how we're thinking about the issues that you've discussed today? Or does it bring to the fore in particular specific things? And are they related to uh, future efforts to try to avoid <laughs> uh, similar kinds of outbreaks? So does anyone take, want to take a crack at that? It seems relevant maybe to the, the maybe some of the issues that Alice talked about, but. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to address it first. Okay. So within some of the uh, initiatives I'm involved with in China, I work with the Biodiversity Committee of the Chinese Academy of Sciences and with CCICED, which is, has far, far too long a name. Um, but broadly, we have a special policy group that focuses on biodiversity. And I was asked to draft guidelines to prevent future pandemics. Amy and I have also been involved with a separate initiative doing something similar. Um, the reality is that if we do not govern how we uh, interact with the natural world, we're going to see a pandemic. So it's inevitable. If you look back at the literature, there have been warnings about this for years. And a lot of it comes down to what we consume, how we consume it, and how we interact with wildlife. If we want to prevent future pandemics, it's not just looking at consumption of wildlife, though that is a strong portion of it, and we need to think about what we eat. In Southeast Asia, wildlife consumption is not really necessary anymore. It's generally for high status food rather than for subsistence. That is a very different story from much of Africa. And of course, the medicine trade, which Amy can address, raises another suite of very difficult to answer questions because it's so much of the culture. In terms of thinking about the disease risk of connecting other populations, that's also very hard to govern because as we open up these areas, what we've seen, for example, with white nose syndrome, which is a disease affecting bats in the US, people basically track that disease there from Europe by not washing their boots. Now, if we have people moving all across Southeast Asia and all across Central Asia, who are not going to be cleaning their boots. That's the reality. If we look at freshwater streams in the UK, they have diseases from crayfish in the US, again, from transporting animals. So we need to think about what are the biosecurity measures we have when we transport animals for food, but also down to how do we actually keep our boots clean, keep our field kit clean when we are moving between these increasingly connected areas, because those are going to spread diseases that will affect our livestock, will affect our wildlife, will affect our trees, and in some cases, like COVID, will affect us. And this will not be the pandemic, the last pandemic we see, unless we learn from it. We learn how to actually alert and have sensible biosecurity measures. So yeah, I'm now in a fairly unlocked down China, but Europe is going to take a lot longer to recover because it didn't take the issue seriously and it did not control movement. I was actually in Italy and in the UK when cases took off in both of those respective countries. And you could see it was inevitable because no measures were put in place. So what is travel going to look like post COVID? None of us know yet, but we need to have biosecurity systems in place that share data when these pandemics start developing, but also screen for common symptoms like temperatures. And when we're moving livestock or animals across borders, how do we actually test to make sure they are not carrying something which could be an issue in another country? Uh, a paper we recently had out was actually looking at the reservoir host of 
COVID, which could have been pangolins because they are a carrier and they may or may not have been legally or illegally imported. The reality is that if we are not screening things that we consume, especially if they are coming from wildlife, it is a risk. If we are farming them in captivity and that captivity is not kept in hygienic conditions, there is a risk that wildlife will spread it to livestock or from um, to captive animals. And if humans then come into close contact with it or consume it, it's a risk. So we need to think how we transport things through these systems because otherwise we will see another post-COVID or SARS-3 event and none of us want to live to see that in our lifetime. Great. Well, thank you very much. There's one more question in chat you can take a look at, but I'm going to close the session since we're at our ending time. And I just want to take the opportunity to thank all of the speakers for a really interesting uh, session today. And uh, thank all of the audience for their patience through technical difficulties and uh, multiple presentations. I think we all learned a great deal today. So thank you very much. And uh, that's it. Thank Good you. evening. Yes, great. Bye-bye. Thank you all. And of course, read the paper if you haven't already and any other papers highlighted today there may also be a well there should be a book coming out later in the year so i'm sure there can be a mailing list following from this if you'd like to stay informed and if you think of any further questions all of us are happy to field them by email so thanks right. for tuning in and hope that you have evoked a new interest in the belt and road and all of the uh, consequences that may ensue great thank you thank you bye Bye-bye.